My name is Julie Holland. For the two or three people here who don't know who I am. So uh, back in 2001, I edited a book called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, which is a nonprofit project, all proceeds from clinical research with MDMA. Um, and then I edited another nonprofit book called The Pop Book, where all proceeds fund clinical research with cancer. Uh, I ran the psychiatric emergency room at Bellevue for nine years. Every Saturday night and Sunday night, I worked a 15, 16 hour trip. Coincidentally, see, I just said trip. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been talking about LSD recently. 15, 16 hour trip. That was sort of what my job was. I never quite knew what I was going to get, and I just had to sort of go with it. I know it was going to get crazy, but I was going to come out the other side and put myself back together. Um, so I wrote a book called We Get to Bellevue about that time. Um, and most recently, I wrote a very insulting, insultingly titled book uh, for women, or for people who don't understand how they better, uh, called Moody Bitches. Um, the truth about the drugs you're taking, the sleep you're missing, the sex you're not having, and what's really making you crazy. Um, and that is a book sort of against how uh, medicalized and Pharmacalized women are getting, uh, whether they're on oral contraceptives or they're taking antidepressants or they're psychotics because they are really moody. So it's pretty anti big pharma and it's also uh, pretty pro cannabis. <coughs> it teaches you about the endocannabinoid system and the special relationship women have with cannabis. I made you predict it. Um, so I was asked to moderate this panel on psychedelic research. I'm the medical monitor of two two groups of studies. Uh, one is uh, MDMA in, in the treatment, um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder, and the other is using cannabis in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I've been involved in talking about psychedelic research and promoting the idea that we need to understand more and that we need to base our drug policy on science and rational thinking. Um, since. Uh, well, since a little before I met Rick Doblin, about 30 years ago now, which is like, it keeps getting longer every time I say how long we know each other. It's like, we used to be 20 years. So, um, I am a believer in psychedelic research. I am a believer in the people that are standing behind me right now. Um, I'm going to let each person introduce themselves just so everybody gets a little bit more time. So, the way this is going to work, and I'm reminding my panel, you guys are going to get about five minutes to just um, say who you are and what you do and you know what's important to you. Um, and then we're going to ask some questions and then we're really going to open it up and just have a discussion. Um, and with that, I, will, I guess we're just going to go left to right. So Dr. Richard Doblin will begin. And then you can have a little something to eat. Are you timing yourself? Good. <laughs> Not so good at keeping to time, but... Uh, first off, thank you all for coming here. It's really good to have these discussions in, in public. I'd also like to uh, invite you all to the mall tonight <laughs> at uh, 11 o'clock for Burning Man on the Mall, as part of our drug war vigil. And we have a permit for it, and we'll be there till sunrise. And so, <laughs> breakfast coming in at 7 a.m. <laughs> for 150 people. So, hopefully. Uh, so, we're, we're sort of specializing in getting permission for things. <laughs> so basically, Max is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to develop psychedelics and marijuana into FDA approved prescription medicines. And so that means working at the same level that the pharmaceutical industry does, trying to meet the same standards of safety and efficacy, um, and really having it be evaluated by by FDA scientists and working with uh, DEA licensing with uh, institutional review boards and we've been doing this um, actually I met Julian in 1985 and uh, 1986 is when I started MAPS and so we've really been for the last 15 years doing studies in patient populations starting with post-traumatic stress disorder and then also now working with autistic adults with social anxiety and also with people with life-threatening illnesses who are anxious about dying. And we just got permission a week ago last Friday for a study that's just a major breakthrough. It's with couples therapy where one of the couple has PTSD. It's been developed by VA-affiliated therapists. 
Um, we can never make couples therapy into uh, medicine uh, MDM, because it's not a disease <laughs> of relationships. So the only kind of things that we can turn through the FDA are uh, treatment of diseases. And that's why the FDA model is limited. It's important, but that's why we're so, that's why we're here at the Drug Policy Alliance Conference because a lot of the uses of MDMA and other psychedelics go outside of the medical model. But what we've seen with marijuana is that medicalization changes people's attitudes towards legalization. So what we've learned so far, um, first off, is that MDMA can be administered safely in the clinical setting. And that's important because there's been a lot of concerns about uh, neurotoxicity. A lot of people were saying one dose, uh, permanent brain damage, long-term functional consequences, and we shouldn't even be allowed to do research to even see if it was that dangerous. And that was quite a difficult hurdle to overcome. People were saying, we already know it's so dangerous that we can't even allow you to do research. So from 1986 till 1992, we tried about five or six different protocols were all rejected by the FDA on this uh, fear of MDMA neurotoxicity. So that's since now that we've been able to get the data, we can definitely say that MDMA can be administered safely in a clinical setting. And we're also able to say that we are getting very promising evidence of efficacy. And we work with the most difficult cases. We work with tre chronic treatment resistant PTSD, and we've been demonstrating that even for people who have failed on other alternatives, that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy can make fundamental changes in how they respond. We've, we've also used um, double-blind placebo-controlled studies, and so what we've been able to tell is that the therapy component of what we administer can be effective itself in reducing PTSD symptoms, but when you add the MDMA, it's more than twice as effective. So what that means to us is that the MDMA is more important in contributing to the overall outcomes than the therapists. But that doesn't mean that it, the therapists aren't crucially important. It just means that there's something pharmacological that the MDMA does about how we process fear and how we process fearful emotions that enables people to do more and more what we're learning about in terms of memory reconsolidation. We're learning that the FDA is open to this kind of research, that the FDA is different than the National Institute on Drug Abuse, different than the DEA. Their institutional mission is trying to provide drugs to help people that are suffering. And so they're sort of out from under the drug war. They, they were part of the drug war from the middle 60s to 1990 when they permitted the first study with psychedelics. But that change was able to happen without any changes in laws without any changes in regulations, but just by interpretation that was different in terms of the risk-benefit balance. So individual bureaucrats have been able to make a difference. We've also learned that, um, for, specifically for PTSD, that the work that we do is independent of the cause of PTSD. It works with women survivors of child sexual abuse, it works with war-related PTSD, and I think from a political point of view, what we've been trying to say is that these are treatments we're trying to develop that are, are not just for aging hippies who are part of um, you know, the baby boom generation that took drugs in college, that uh, these are for the mainstream. And so one of the things we're most proud of is we were able to start LSD research for the first time in 45 years in Switzerland. It was for people with a life-threatening illness who were scared about dying. It was a small pilot study of 12 people 11 out of those 12 people had never done LSD before. So when people are suffering a crisis, they're willing to go to unusual means. And also, in our study with PTSD, we've actually been able to attract um, firefighters and a police officer. So even a police officer who was sort of trained to suppress these things in a moment of you know, suffering was willing to, to reach out. And so we're also finally able to learn that we're at this crucial transition now between the phase two pilot studies and the phase three definitive pivotal studies. And we're summarizing the data from over 100 PTSD patients. It's taken us 15 years, over $6 million. And um, we'll be negotiating with FDA. And we anticipate that it'll be roughly 400 patients, about $22 million. And 2021 is when 
we're projecting MDNA will be approved. And we already have over $11 million pledged or in hand for that process, and I think we'll be able to do it. So I think the main message I'd like to leave you with is that there is a route to develop psychedelics through the FDA. We're on track. You'll hear more about the work of psilocybin. The, the problem is with marijuana, there's still this fundamental uh, government obstruction, which is the monopoly on the supply of DEA legal marijuana that's held by the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the Great <coughs> Monopoly. And once that happens, then medical marijuana will be able to go through the FDA as well. Great. Thanks so much. For University uh, uh, in New York City and at NYU we have uh, we have four current trials using psilocybin uh, currently ongoing, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, but first, the question of the, of the panel is what is psychedelic research telling us? I did a little bit qualitative study where I did in-depth interviews with some of the patients who had cancer and existential distress, and this is what one woman who was in her early 60s said about her experience. She said, I had feelings of being connected to everything. I mean everything in nature. Everything, even like pebbles, drops of water in the sea. It's like magic. It was wonderful. And it wasn't like talking about it, which makes it an idea. It was experiential. It was like being inside a drop of water, being inside a butterfly's wing, and being inside of a cheetah's eyes. Words fail me. It was wonderful, just wonderful. So, maybe some of you are, are wondering, like, what are psychedelics, and how <laughs> do they work? And so, in the university setting, we have limited means, we have some means of asking some of those questions. So, what do we know? We know that psychedelics, I'm talking about serotonergic psychedelics, the classic hallucinogens. We know that they're not habit-forming in animal models. We know that they're uh, you know, safe, effective to lethal, uh, drug dose ratio is exceedingly high to get an awful lot of psychedelics to, to die. Uh, and we know that in supportive contexts, they are exceedingly safe and efficacious for a variety of clinical conditions. We also know, uh, I'm coming at this having started an SSDP chapter in 2000 mm -hmm. by uh, undergraduate university and then working in prisons for 10 years. <laughs> applied to, to uh, for, I think, like, Jag's previous job in 2005, I didn't get an interview, but it was good because I came to NYU, uh, and with the help of Julie Holland, we started a group uh, called PRG, which is a psychedelic reading group, which within a year and a half came to the psychedelic research group, and we started a study treating patients with cancer. But on the question of crime and recidivism with SSDP and its insane or drug laws, the, you know, national surveys show uh, just in the last couple of uh, years, that uh, you would expect that people who are on community justice supervision, parolees, that drug use would be associated with, with bad outcomes. That would be the, the sort of myth. What they find actually is that psychedelic use is associated with, is protected, protected against recidivism in this population. So strangely, people who are on parole actually do better when taking psychedelics, and we don't know exactly why. The same thing is true across for 190,000 United States adults, most drugs are either not associated or negatively associated with high rates of suicide and increased psychological distress and anxiety and depression, except for the psychedelics, which are strangely protective against those things, at least in, they're, they're uh, you know, negatively correlated with, with these indications. And that's in a controlled model controlling for class, race, and other demographic variables. What's going on? At NYU, we're doing a number of things. So the, I'll just tell you about three studies. The first study is uh, we just finished. We're running at the results. Uh, and we're looking to get them published. Um, this is a study where we gave psilocybin to people who had cancer and incredible uh, existential distress and, and clinically elevated anxiety. It was a supportive environment with two therapists. And the results are out. The results are that we had massive effect sizes 
in all of our outcome variables. The depression effect size is greater than one, uh, so our, our participants had, uh, compared to people who did not get the active psilocybin, after six weeks, much lower rates of depression, much lower scores on clinical anxiety measures for both state and trait anxiety, lower death anxiety, lower demoralization, and lower hopelessness, and improved quality of life, improved spiritual well-being, and improved meaning and peace. Now, if these were small effects, there wouldn't be such an, you know, an unexpected claim. But these, the, with anxiety and depression, the effect sizes are 1.1 to 1.3. To give you an idea, if you have an average intelligence, an IQ of 100, and you had an effect size for treatment this large, you would go from being in a normal class to an advanced honors class. It's like a 20-point bump in IQ. So we're having massive changes and shifts in terms of our clinical measures. Um, on our qualitative uh, scale, uh, our qualitative study, we had, uh, I shared a quote from you. We found that, um, we found that the story about how psychedelics work may not be so simple. So the leading hypothesis, and we know that to be true, is that people may have uh, a mystical type experience, and that that will predict these really incredible clinical outcomes down the road, even up to a, a year out. And that may be true, but the question is, what does that look like? And the participants told us a variety of complex things about their lives. These mystical type experiences that they had, these really powerful spiritual experiences they had with psilocybin, were not like zen, isolated, individual, on the mountain experiences. They were deeply relationally embedded. They were about their siblings, their mother, their father, their girlfriend, their child. And so they were relationally embedded. And they were about primary attachment relationships. And we also realized that they were about the body. These people had cancer. And they were having experiences where a powerful vision of having fear of their cancer, which was in their abdomen, exploding like a mushroom cloud from their chest, a black cloud, and then suddenly feeling liberated, liberated from their fear. The powerful feelings of having the cancer escape through their fingers. These were people who were in remission. Um, that seemed to be really, really meaningful for them. Finally, uh, and then finally we have a lot of really interesting findings. It's coming out in the Journal of uh, APA Journal of Humanistic Psychology, they're doing a special issue in the spring on psychedelics. Uh, and so you can find the findings there. A lot of really interesting work on the shadow. And what does that mean? How do we help people integrate difficult, trying, dark night of the soul's ego-death experiences? Are these distressing experiences something to be avoided? Or something to be worked through? And if so, how? And from our, our own participants, we have their personal stories about what what works for them. <coughs> um, the last thing I'll tell you about later, which really <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to you. <laughs> Great, hi. Um, so my name is Ingmar Gorman. Uh, can you hear me okay? You're loud, loud. You're loud? Okay. Uh, my name is Ingmar Gorman, and I'm at the New School for Cultural Research and a doctoral student there. And uh, I am helping maps with some of their research, specifically. Uh, the research of MDMA for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about some of my involvements, because they, they really influence the way that I think and uh, probably some of the things I'll be talking about. Um, I'm also at the Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and uh, Research, so I, I have some of the psychoanalytic way of thinking a little bit. And um, also I work with Andrew Tatarski at a center for uh, Optimal Living, and he's spoken here uh, on another panel. So thinking about harm reduction psychotherapy and how that fits with substance abuse, substance misuse. Um, so in terms of what I do for MAPS specifically, uh, one of my responsibilities is to act as a adherence rater supervisor. So for those of you who uh, are familiar or may not be familiar with adherence rating, essentially a process during which we watch video sessions of psychotherapy, the MDMA therapy, and we are looking to see to what degree therapists are following a kind of a psychotherapy manual. So the reason why this uh, particular kind of thing excites me, what we call psychotherapy process research, or psychotherapy research, uh, is very much connected to what uh, Rick had mentioned uh, about sort of the drug effect and the therapy <coughs> that, that we, uh, there is an effect for the drug. You can see that uh, in these red uh, trials. Uh, uh, but we are not entirely sure how the uh, therapy actually interacts uh, with the medicine. We, we presume it does, uh, but we're not exactly sure how. 
So I have a, a thought experiment actually that uh, I'd like to present to you that um, a faculty member of mine, an uh, advisor I work with, had brought up. So imagine that we had somebody going through uh, MDMA PTSD therapy, and uh, we gave them the MDMA, and what we did was put them under general general anesthesia. So there would probably be some sort of drug interaction, something like it's now an advocate to just like you know, thought experiment. But I mean, imagine, right, that they have absolutely no conscious awareness of what was happening through uh, their environment. They're sort of the classically set and setting, right? They were completely under. And in some way, you can maybe hypothesize that, we're, that we would be looking at a pure effect of the drug itself. And the question would be, uh, would we see improvement in uh, trauma symptoms uh, after we, we did this, this, this study, this experiment? Uh, the point being that, uh, and Michael Bogenschutz has a great article, uh, and he writes about this. Michael Bogenschutz uh, has been running, uh, he completed a pilot study looking at psilocybin for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Um, and he has a great way of talking about the sort of psychosocial therapy sort of factors that might be uh, influencing the combined effect between the psychotherapy and the, uh, the, the drug, whether it be MDMA or psilocybin. Um, and so what I try to do, uh, and I emphasize try because this work is really, really difficult, is to follow the psychotherapy, use different instruments to measure uh, quantitatively uh, and kind of qualitatively too, uh, what is happening. And there are certain important implications for what uh, this could tell us. One is, how can we continue to improve therapy to maximize uh, outcome improvement? Uh, it can tell us um, how to train therapists in the future. Uh, and it might also tell us uh, a little bit about why some people might not be responding to the therapy. Right? and how we can maybe change or adapt the way that we're working uh, in terms, in order to again maximize outcome. So, you know, this is very, this, the theme of this uh, panel is sort of what's on the, the sort of cutting edge of psychedelic research. Maybe uh, I would like to very much have a discussion with all of you in the Q&A about um, what might we be anticipating to come next. So because it, you, you must be very mindful of the fact that Phase two studies, again, whether we're talking about MDMA or psilocybin, is looking at uh, efficacy, so, um, which is different from effectiveness. So we're talking about, does, do these treatments have potential? And then later we look at, we look at effectiveness. Larger sample size, more people. Um, and then we want to see whether it's going to work out, out work outside of both clinical uh, science research settings. Right? It's an important step. I mean, we're not exactly sure what will happen there. But when we begin to increase the sample sizes, we can then begin to ask more complicated questions. Not what does it work or does it not work, but looking at other variables. And I think that's really exciting to start generating even sort of new ideas about how we can evaluate and look at uh, this, this research and this So, let's see. I, I have some themes that maybe I'll just throw out there that I have generated before this talk, and maybe we can come back to it later. Um, one, discussion I'd very much like to have is maybe about a one-person versus two-person psychology or psychotherapy in terms of these trials or in terms of therapy. Um, maybe something about attachment research, something about metacognition. We have a term called reflective function, this capacity to reflect on one's experience. Um, and also storytelling, I think that's a good merger between us too. So, so what kind of stories are told during psychotherapy and how that might be related to uh, um, and I'm going to leave it at that for now. The idea that to follow the one that come before me, or whether to follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not quite sure where to start. Basically, my new plan is building a sort of foundation. I think you need to be better. Are you speaking to the, the top of the microphone? Um, the I run a foundation. Okay. Um, and um, it does. Um, cutting edge uh, neuroscience and clinical studies into psychoactive substances. Um, my aim has always been to research and it's been finally, this year actually, we've done the first ever brain imaging study at LSD. Um, but I've been trying to do that for 35 years, so it's been a long struggle. But just to go back to why 
I started with it was because my special subject was um, mystical experiences and comparative religions. And then, in the 60s, and then I started with Dr. Ferdinand and the Sermon um, And then I took psychedelics and realized what transformational um, experience they can make and how they can make a difference um, in the world to individuals and society. And so, in 1966, I met a Dutch scientist who introduced me to um, a scientific approach into the, what are the mechanisms underlying changes in consciousness based on changes in blood supply, the ego, the ego, things. So now, when I in 1998, I started back and since then I've been doing this research. And now we do cutting edge research um, at the Beckett Imperial Research Program, which is explaining why, for instance, MDMA has its effect as an aid to cerebral and post-traumatic stress disorder by, by um, um, making people positive reaction greater, but negative less, so they're more able to approach the trauma and <coughs> And um, how AIDS um, relationship with therapists. And also the psilocybin um, um, search showed how um, the blood supply to the D4 nerve network, which is like the ego, the underlying part of the ego, what used to be the ego, um, the blood supply is reduced, so its function is reduced. And in, say, the chronic depression, um, two pumps are hyperactive, so by turning that function down, it led to a treatment to a depression with suicide, and we just keep and it's showing um, surprisingly good results, extremely positive results, so it's more time study now. But um, for those of you interested in the ego and how just consciousness, which was always a great passion of mine, um, this study is the first to show what August Huxley knew, but no one had ever shown before, how the mechanism underlying the blood supply changes the society to be much more chaotic and um, entropic brain state, which um, lends itself to creativity, and, uh, to, um, but also to um, um, breakthroughs in therapy and become the common universe. So um, basically what I do is try to navigate moving forward in our knowledge because I've always thought that the breakthrough of reintegrating these substances into society is dependent on us removing this misplaced taboo on them. And the best way to do that is with the language of science because the whole world might be most difficult to contradict science. And so that's what I've been doing over the last 20 years. And um, now that this body is up, we can have a lot of that wonderful research on psilocybin, the overcoming of nicotine addiction, and pilot study, we started many years ago, and that's had an 80% success rate, but it's, I think I might be saying. But, um, it's, it's very exciting how the evidence is beginning to build up on many fronts that these are incredibly <laughs> So I think they're a very exciting point. And we also work at um, Impulse, it's a, it sort of runs together and they interact with each other, policy and stuff. and I am a researcher on the faculty at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and uh, I work with a team of uh, over a dozen different uh, medical doctors, neuroscientists, uh, psychotherapists, uh, uh, different kinds of research psychologists and scientists uh, who have been working since about 1999-2000 uh, uh, studying psilocybin uh, in humans 
uh, and that includes uh, people like Owen Griffiths, <coughs> Matt Johnson, Bill Richards, Catherine McLean, Fred Barrett. Uh, I just wanted to <coughs> point out that I'm, I'm just one very small part of this group, but uh, I'm happy that I'm able to be here today to talk to you all about this exciting research. Um, so over the last 15 years or so, uh, the work at Hopkins has been focused mainly on psilocybin, although there's also been interesting research on uh, drugs like salivinorum and uh, dextromethorphan as well. Um, but nonetheless, we've been um, working on uh, administering psilocybin primarily uh, uh, in a number of different populations, so including healthy, naive volunteers, meaning uh, people who have never taken psychedelics before, to establish uh, whether or not these drugs are safe for them. Uh, and also to test the, whether or not these drugs have any sort of um, lasting effects, which uh, the data seem to point to um, lasting beneficial effects from high dose uh, exposure to psilocybin in the lab uh, in healthy volunteers. Uh, we've also been working with people who uh, are near the end of life with a life threatening illness. Uh, we've also been working with people who are trying to quit smoking, uh, which, uh, as you may or may not know, is one of the leading preventable causes of death and for right now, in which there aren't very good treatments to get people to quit. So um, we've been looking at all these different areas um, to really try to establish um, the feasibility of using psilocybin in a medical setting. And uh, our results so far have been very promising uh, in terms of, as Amanda pointed out, uh, helping people quit smoking, uh, as well as um, helping uh, healthy, normal people to enhance their own well-being and spirituality. And that's kind of the growing edge of the research that uh, we're working on now with long-term meditators, understanding how the drugs function in the brain, um, and working with religious professionals, for instance, um, like rabbis, priests, ministers, to see how psilocybin will affect their spiritual life. Um, so, uh, as you can see, that's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, we're talking about, uh, on the one hand, treating addiction, um, and on the other hand, helping people who don't have any sort of uh, pathology, per se, um, to enhance their well-being, uh, you know, and as well as working with people with their life. And so all of these different areas um, have really shown the promise uh, for psilocybin to be useful. Uh, and so we are hoping, along with other groups like MAPS, uh, Beckley, and Hector Research Institute, who's been primarily funding a lot of the research that we've been doing, um, that uh, we can make a good case for eventually uh, approaching the FDA and making these drugs uh, medications that can be prescribed by physicians and uh, administered in a you know, properly controlled medical setting. And uh, we do think that this will be very useful to help a lot of people who are suffering needlessly at the moment. So um, that's our general kind of mission, and uh, that's what we'll be working on hopefully for the next 10 years or so. Um, kind of, you know, you heard about um, uh, Rick mentioned that 2021 for uh, MDMA to be approved as a medication. We don't have any sort of timeline like that right now that I know of, but uh, it's certainly something that we're thinking about as well. So, for so far. Uh, thanks all for being here. Um, what I want to ask you, and I'm sorry I didn't ask you this ahead of time, it's okay to ask you, but ironically it's about being open, it's about openness. Um, I was hoping that you could speak a little bit about the study that came out of Hopkins, um, specifically looking at the outcome measurement of openness. Are you comfortable talking about that? Yes. Go ahead. So. And why, why do I care about openness? Why do you think it's important? So just a little crash course in uh, human personality. Um, there's what's called a sort of ocean model of personality, ocean being uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Those seem to be five of the uh, most stable sort of factors of human personality that have been measured uh, since the advent of personality theory. Um, and we're going back into like the 1980s or so with Oscar and McCray who came up with this, uh, with this theory of personality. Um, one of the things that they found over all these years of research on that kind of personality uh, theory <coughs> is that uh, as adults get to about age 30, uh, their personality sort of settles into a uh, stable structure that doesn't change a whole lot over the, the rest of their adult life. Uh, one of the really interesting papers that was published by my friend, uh, Dr. Catherine McLean, uh, in 2011 was looking at a full analysis of a bunch of people that had gotten psilocybin. It was 52 people uh, who were all healthy, normal volunteers. 
uh, who got high doses of psilocybin in the lab. And what she found, these were all adult people, uh, was that uh, a year after, and actually more than a year after their um, uh, exposure to psilocybin in the laboratory, uh, there was a significant and lasting increase in the personality domain of openness. Uh, so this is uh, a drug experience that happens today, uh, and a year and a couple of months out from now, your personality is still different. You're more open to experience as a construct, um, you know, uh, elucidates. And also, uh, some of the other parts of that uh, personality construct are aesthetic appreciation, appreciation of nature, uh, tolerance for others' viewpoints. So right now, when we're looking at all the sort of violence and conflict um, between different uh, ideologies, uh, you know, it, it seems like a particularly germane and important thing to be able to manipulate that construct um, such that people may be more open to understanding and listening to other viewpoints in a non-violent manner. So, um, I do think that's one of the most interesting findings that have come out of our lab in the last few years. Um, so, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think so too. Yeah. 
trying to. Uh, so maybe I could preface this with an uh, experience that I had recently. I go quite frequently to different colleges uh, in the area around New York to talk about uh, this research. And what I find often is a difficult hurdle to, to jump, which is It's, you know, uh, maybe I'll put it this way. It's easier, I think, for people to make a kind of look into the future with regards to medical marijuana and marijuana. It's sort of, you can kind of think of it as uh, well, something people have experienced drinking beer, right? People have experienced drinking <laughs> marijuana. It's sort of like the way that it's used is different from how psychedelics are used. And so when I begin to speak about psychedelic research and MDMA research, there's a hurdle that I encounter uh, speaking to the public where there's the, and the hurdle that's there, the, the, the gap that exists, is a gap that has to do with substance use and substance use treatment and the conceptualization of what it means to use a drug and that that doesn't necessarily mean that you will 100% of the time uh, have an addiction or that you're necessarily going to use it. Um, so that being said, it kind of ties into what uh, Andrew Tatarski, myself, Catherine McLean, uh, and we have a few other members on our staff, uh, Janet Talley and Michael Benigby. We started this program called the uh, Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program. And it's sort of a multifaceted kind of thing. One thing that we're doing is we're offering uh, services, therapy services, for individuals who have some sort of, have had or, or have some sort of relationship with psychedelics, whether they've been ingested them in the past or whether they're curious about them. And the main aim is from sort of a harm reduction perspective is to reduce harm uh, associated with that use. And it, that also means education. So, um, and the interesting piece of that project for me, the thing that I think I'm probably most excited about, is actually educating and offering you know, small workshops to mental health professionals in the field who know nothing about this world, right? So the example that I often have in my head is somebody who's had an experience with a psychedelic. They go to the therapist because they're, they want to work on something in their life. Right? And then they mention that they go to an ayahuasca community, a ritual. Right? They have something they do or, or whatever. And the, what is the reaction of the therapist? Right? There, there are many different kinds of reactions. It can be as extreme as, oh, well, I think you need to go to, uh, to AA, right? Or uh, you need to seek treatment in, uh, related to substances and I can't do that. Or it could be more subtle, it could be a kind of shaming, right? And this, is, this is also picked up from, um, I think, the consequence of the drug war, right? And how many of us have been educated about, um, or miseducated about uh, substances. And so what I'm most excited about is sort of trying to begin to kind of correct that a little bit by offering information not just about the research, but also what does it mean, what could it mean if one of your clients, or their clients, is using a psychedelic? What is, why? What is their motivation? Be curious about it rather than, than judging it. Um, and could that then empower the therapy? Uh, so that's sort of a little taste of uh, what, uh, what we're doing, uh, what we're beginning to do. It's, we launched it last week and uh, we're still kind of. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome to New York City. Um, uh, I'm going to give you an optional question. If there's something else you'd rather talk about, just say pass. But you mentioned something about uh, recidivism and criminal behavior, and it got me wondering, are you comfortable talking about possibly using psychedelics in the treatment of antisocial personality disorder? And you know, what do you think that would mean? You know, there's, there's sort of an understanding that these people are broken and can't be fixed. And you know, the, the joke I made in Begins of Bellevue was like, what these people really need is a personality transplant. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> oh. scratch that. A childhood transplant. They've had terrible childhoods. And what do we do about that? And to me, there's a place for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in uh, not replacing the childhood, but coming to terms with it, accepting it, accepting that it's going to be an obstacle. And, Growth and development. Uh, I'm just wondering if you feel comfortable talking about the possible treatment of social personality disorder. Uh, I'll take a pass, Carrie. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me come out of my Rubik's Square cube. Uh, my thought on that is this: that there are so many people, I'm sure many of us in the room, having significant childhood trauma experiences that lead to personality issues in later life that are very difficult to treat. Um, 
And one of the things that's so fascinating about working with psychedelic medicines, as I think many people here might attest, is that they're deeply transformative. These are not surface level interventions. They can be profoundly transformative, even of the healing of perhaps even deep trauma. So um, one of the issues with this throughout is that there's so much skepticism about these experiences. So how many of you had an experience like this, like you're in a college dorm room and you're like, Rick, I'd like to share with you this really deeply powerful drug experience that I had. I felt like I met God. And, and then Rick is like, it's just the drugs talking, man, you know? <laughs> I don't think Rick's ever said that, but I think that. There's this inbuilt skepticism. So I just want to, I want to show this last study because I think it's relevant. So uh, we just wrote a paper with uh, Ralph Hood, and uh, who's the creator of the mysticism scale, uh, and uh, Andrew, New uh, Andrew Newberg, who's a famous neurotheologist, uh, and a team at UPenn. And what they did was we put out a, a survey of uh, over 700 people, asking them about their profound spiritual experience. And we gave them, uh, you know, validated measures about spirituality, mysticism, religious impact. And then we also asked them a question. Was this spiritual experience occasioned by a psychedelic substance? Yes or no? And then we compared the two groups. And, you know, uh, William James said we should judge these experiences not by their roots, but by their fruits. Right? But like the tree should be judged by what it provides. And what we found was, and this is coming out in the spring, that the people who had deeply profound religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences that were occasioned by a psychedelic, um, on the standard measures, rated those experiences as being more mystical, having and resulted in a lowered fear of death, a greater sense of purpose, and increased meaning and spirituality in their lives. So this is very interesting, and I think it asks us all to like, think deeply about transformation and how to uh, take the veils of skepticism away and let you know thoughtful research lead the way to help us answer these questions because these are powerful substances that should be treated with respect uh, and, I, and I, I have I have hope that there could be some healing could be trauma in the future. Thanks very much. Um, Rick, I was hoping uh, we talked a little bit about openness and accepting other people's worldviews, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about empathy and MDMA and world peace. <laughs> in, in two minutes. <laughs> what really has motivated me to devote my life to bringing back psychedelics is this idea of world peace. Um, and that this idea that the psychedelic mystical experience has political implications. And we've also, in the MDMA research, found this same phenomenon with openness as I think we're working on a paper about that as well. Um, I think that this idea of um, the violence that we see in the world is because people are identifying themselves with their tribe, their country, their religion, and then it creates these us and them dichotomies. And that the mystical experience, that classic element of it, is a sense of unity. And if you can experience that, then I think you realize that we're primarily the same, we're primarily part of this web of life, and that then people that are different from you are not so much a cause for fear and anxiety, but they're something that they're more similar, so you can appreciate and celebrate the differences and see how you can learn from each other. I think if we can have people, millions of people, billions of people that can experience that, and whether it's through psychedelics or not, I think the mystical experience has those implications. But I just think for most people, the, for me and many people, it's, it's more been through psychedelics that these experiences have been created. Um, one thing I want to say, though, that is in the research, we've looked at uh, whether people have mystical experiences under MDMA. And you might think that the answer is no, that, that it's all about relationships, about openness, and about you know, empathy. But actually we find that there's a substantial fraction of people that do have full mystical experiences. Around one third of our people have um, a, about uh, 0.6 or above on the States of Consciousness questionnaire. But the key difference between the work that we're doing in therapy and the work that's being done with psilocybin is that we do not see a correlation between the mystical experience and the therapeutic outcome. And we've looked pretty closely at that. And, and partially that's um, relating to what we think is this newer understanding of memory and memory reconsolidation. That when you have trauma, and, or, or you know, as we talked about, adverse childhood experiences, that people have a very difficult time 
um, working through them. And that when you are under the influence of MDMA, you can look from a position of safety at a prior trauma. And we find that people's memory for their traumas increases under MDMA. So actually, it's not like forgetting that it ever happened, that we've had um, veterans and, and firefighters, others who said that under the influence of MDMA, they, they had whole parts of their the explosion or the fires that, that other people were killed in that they had blocked out. And that the memory comes back, so the repressed memories come back because this sort of fear threshold is reduced. And then, when you're looking at it from a position of safety, then when you reconsolidate the memory, it's again done, coded sort of with this position of retrospective sense. It was then and not now, and it doesn't have that same emotional tone. So then when you remember the trauma again at a later date, you have more information about the trauma, but the fear is no longer directly associated with it. And so that helps explain one of the surprising things that we've learned in our study, trying to figure out how to do double-blind research with psychedelics. And then trying to, how do we fit into the methodology that the FDA wants to see? And so we thought about a dose-response study, that everybody gets the same, they all know what they're getting, um, but they don't know the dose. And so everybody's uh, sort of demand characteristics are similar, and just we thought that there would be this linear relationship between the low dose, which we said was 30 milligrams, the medium dose was 75 milligrams, and then the full dose was 125 milligrams. And to our surprise, the 75 milligram group was actually doing the best. And that's because I think people are more grounded in their biography. They don't have a lot of these body rushes or these more necessarily more mystical experiences, but they're able to stay connected to their biography and their trauma, but they're still feeling the reduction of fear. So our therapeutic method, I think, is really different than the therapeutic method with psilocybin because there is a sense to want to encourage people to have a mystical experience because that's the, the mediator of therapeutic outcomes. So we have a, a different approach, more of a non-directive approach, following people's unconscious wherever it goes. And if it goes to a mystical experience, we'll support it, but that's not a necessary part of our treatment. But I do think that this political implications in world peace uh, the mystical experience is, is a key. Yeah. I also think that... Uh, <laughs> this idea that MDMA sort of lessens the fear response, that there are sort of augmented oxytocin levels that happen and allow people to feel more trusting and more connected. You know, we know one of the things that uh, sort of correlates with uh, successful therapy is what's called a therapeutic alliance, how um, allied and connected the therapist and the, the client feel. And we know, uh, maybe we don't know yet, but I think we'll know soon, maybe with so many of work, um, that this MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, you know, one of the reasons why it may work is that there's this enhanced therapeutic alliance. Um, anyway, we are going to open up for Q&A, and I'm going to walk around the room. Like, anybody remember Phil Donahue? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, okay, go ahead. Uh, so in relation to the dark night of the soul aspect and handling these therapeutic sessions, uh, using therapy animals as a way to get through the experience and accepting the ego death. Um, I know from my own self, I've had my own psychedelic session at home, uh, and I've gone through several of those really hard experiences with the dark night of the soul. Uh, I felt like having my dog there present helped me manage that. It was almost like as if he had my back kind of thing, like if I went there and wasn't afraid to let go, he was there kind of like to keep my back and keep guard of me as well, like in my home too. So just maybe as that component for the future, studying this and helping reach a deeper level with that. And you know, he described, the woman said, you know, I felt like I was inside the winged butterfly inside of the eye of a cheetah. It obviously shows a real deep connection with nature. Our pets is you know, one of the very few deep connections with nature we still have in society. All right, so good question. I don't know if anyone's looking at the use of therapeutic animals, or uh, does anybody want to take this and share the mics? I have, uh, whoa, this is loud. Um, so <laughs> I had a, um, so while observing some of the, the videos, uh, the sessions with MDMA for PTSD, Actually, there are, are so part of the treatment. Uh, there is a point in which 
uh, the person going through the therapy can invite an important person uh, into the session with them. Um, or, these are not necessarily the, the, the drug sessions, but some of the other sessions are it. And uh, you'd be surprised how often there would be a dog <laughs> in the session. I'm like, great, it's another variable that I'm going to have to sort of look at. <laughs> right? um, so, um, you know, I, I, don't, I can't speak to the, the dark night of the soul and those aspects of it. Um, and I don't think this is necessarily an intentional design study, but certainly I've observed uh, having a, a pet there and that calming, grounding experience um, of having uh, that kind of trusting and close relationship um, to be uh, important. Yeah. I'd just like to share, um, I had, a, I brought up a pigeon on um, a paintbrush with some Weetabix when, before it had a new, it mother died. And it lived with me for 15 years as my lover. And um, <laughs> it, it, was, it was just my beloved. We loved each other more than anything else in the world. And he loved one or one's companions if they were high. And he was totally tele telepathic. I mean, one knew when he was in danger, when he knew, it, it was amazing. I knew when he died, actually. Um, it, it was a very strange relationship of <laughs> love and psychedelics. <laughs> trying for quite a few years, and Doug is actually the one that uh, made the first donation to our Evergreen project, which we're super grateful for. Uh, but we have completed two studies, one now in the Mexico clinic and one now in uh, New Zealand. And so the, the, the thought, I think one of the, the main mistakes of the 60s has been the overhype of the psychedelics, that one dose, miracle cure, and then you're cured. And, or it's been in reverse, you know, one goes permanent brain damage, and then you're screwed for life. <laughs> so, which is it? It's more of a miracle. <laughs> but what we found is that um, through great, great struggle, we've been able to do a, a, one, a study with about um, 30 people in the U.S., about 15 people in New Zealand, and what we're showing is that if you look at the outcomes in terms of abstinence, um, then it's not that good. It, it's, but it's, it's better than a lot of the treatments. It's around 20, 25% or so that people will go through it. But these are kind of clinics where people go from where they normally live to have treatment, then they go back to where they normally live. There's not a lot of continuing care. There's not a lot of preparation. And we know that the integration process is the key for really making experiences with psychedelics have lasting impacts. So we're sort of looking at situations that are already by design not ideally suited towards long-term personality change in terms of reduction of um, opiate use or other. But if you look at um, sort of through the addiction severity index, which is a, a quantitative measure to kind of get at the, the different realms of your life that are impacted by addiction, if you don't look at just abstinence, if you look at reduction of number of heavy drinking days or heavy opiate days or various things like that, then it, it, uh, that looks a lot better. And so I think the evidence, we're, we're now preparing them for publication. Um, it's going to, I think, create a lot more interest in further research. But I think one of the other weaknesses of the model is that most people have done Ibogaine only one time. They've gone to a clinic, they've had one experience, they've come back to their normal situation, and they come back where they don't have the um, withdrawal symptoms, they no longer have the physical addiction, 
they've done a lot of the reduction of cravings, but there's still a lot of work to go. And so I think the kind of situation that will be more likely to be helpful is where people have several experiences over a period of time. And also a lot of people that have addiction problems also have trauma in their background. So ideally what we're talking about is psychedelic psychotherapy. And sometimes people could be benefited by you know, an Ibogaine experience followed by a two months later with an MDMA experience, then you could have a psilocybin experience, then you have an ayahuasca experience. But I think that is really the idea that, that these are tools that can be part of a long term process, and each of them has their own little angle into the psyche. Yeah. They all have different advantages. So the, the Ibogaine research, though, will show that it's helpful and that it's deserving of more study. Okay, so integration, really important point, glad it was brought up. I mean, one of the reasons why so many people are quitting smoking cigarettes through the Hopkins program is that there's a lot of post-psychedelic session discussion and integration. And maybe one of the reason, reasons why people, you know, why, they're, why it's 20, 25% and a little bit higher with that beginning is that people are going right back to their environment. So this idea that uh, you take a big bite and then you need to chew, you need to process. And that's why the psychedelic program in New York City is so important. I didn't mean to take away your mic there, but I did. Um, because uh, one of the things that the psychedelic program is offering in New York City is for people who have had experiences to come and process them more um, in a non-shaming environment, in an educational environment, in a harm reductionist environment. And this happens in my <coughs> private practice, that people come to me and they've had very intense experiences with ayahuasca or with psilocybin and they're, you know, they're not back to baseline and they need help integrating it and meanwhile, you know, they're, people want to give them antipsychotics. So, um, integration is crucial. Glad you brought it up. You have a question. Hi, firstly, thank you everyone for all of your amazing work. Truly, this is a very special conference and a very special time that we live in. Um, so my question, we've spoken a lot about the psychotherapy, psychotherapeutic uses of psychedelics. And um, a little bit has been touched upon the physiological component that uh, you know volunteers or patients are experiencing, such as the blood pressure um, distribution in the body, and also the uh, concept of the cancer in the body being released. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, where is the research going in terms of the healing aspects? So, for instance, ayahuasca curing certain diseases and how much study is going towards the mind-body connection, where we're going with that, and, uh, <coughs> yeah, thank you. I'm going to give you the um, With ISIS, we are doing a prolonged examination of people who've been to um, the Temple of Light in Peru, taking ayahuasca, which is just beginning. But there's going to be quite a lot of people and we'll track down some of those improvements or things that they don't like about that. So we'll know more about it at the end of that um, session. Uh, it, you know, there's a whole field of psychoneuroimmunology, and so it's pretty clear that the mind affects the immune system. Um, I think we're, we so far have kind of shied away from any kind of um, looking at does uh, you know, MDMA for end of life or psilocybin for end of life actually prolong life because that's the kind of thing that people really want to hear and then you really need a lot of evidence for that. And so we've been sort of focusing on the psychological rather than the physiological. But for PTSD, it's pretty well known that people who have PTSD have uh, higher uh, expenses in terms of healthcare utilization for other physical problems. And so one of the big questions is going to be not only do we, how do we get psychedelics approved as medicines, but then will insurance companies cover it? Um, so now we're working with, uh, we're exploring a partnership with Kaiser Permanente out in California. And they're possibly going to be, uh, be a site for one of our phase three studies. They have all sorts of data on all the other healthcare utilization of their people with PTSD. Now, that's not a direct study of psychedelics and immune system function. Uh, and there are some leading ayahuasca shamans who died of cancer. So I think there's been an overhype about how you know, psychedelics can cure cancer. There's been early reports of some people having spontaneous remissions of cancer after MDMA. 
I think we're a long way away from really understanding the mechanisms and how to stimulate your own immune system. But we are trying to now, in the uh, study that we're doing out in California with uh, MDMA life threatening illnesses, we are starting to think about adding a whole series of you know, analysis of immune system function before and after. So it's really important. Okay, another question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's fine. Uh, so there's some really interesting research being done on um, anti-inflammatory properties of the classical hallucinogens, and I have some friends who are very interested in anti-inflammatory work with people with mild cognitive impairment, and so there's some very specific physical things. But I think your question is more, more nuanced, which is about the mind-body. And one of the things that I think is interesting that we found in some of our qualitative research is that people stop identifying the self as being just like the brain in the bucket of the head, which the body is a machine that carries around. And so the consciousness expands for them from a very acute, discrete area to a larger place, which is the full body. They feel their heartbeat, they feel their blood flow, and they have uh, some sort of relationship with like rejection or identification of a cancer, like this malignant growth as being actually part of who they are in this world. And even to go back to like the, the animal research expansion of consciousness beyond just the self into the room, interpersonally, and to interspecies communications, is difficult because of the stigma. Like John Lilly did all this work with talking with animals and dolphins a long, not that long ago, a few decades ago. And so it becomes difficult to think about how we work with animals. But I think anyone who studied indigenous relationships with animals and ally work and work uh, with, with uh, powerful psychoactive plants and chemicals is that it's like integrative throughout, right? So. Uh, you mentioned something about large doses for psilocybin. And I was wondering uh, what the large doses are in terms of the setting for that and also for a TNC. So, um, Albert, I think that may be for you. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know if this mic is on or not. I should just be yelling. <laughs> So uh, the large doses that we use right now uh, in our laboratory at Hopkins are 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms body weight. Um, and what that amounts to roughly, and this is difficult to say because obviously there's different potency of different kinds of mushrooms and so forth, but um, we say it's in the ballpark of about a quarter of an ounce of dried mushrooms. Um, it would be the high dose that we use. Um, there's a team at University of Wisconsin-Madison who's uh, going up higher than that right now. Also, um, Dr. Michael Bogenschutz, who's working, uh, who was working at the University of New Mexico, is now working uh, uh, over at NYU, uh, is looking at treating alcohol, um, alcoholism using a high dose of psilocybin. And a really interesting thing that is you know, being parsed out by that work is that um, for people who suffer from alcohol use disorders, um, it seems like they may need even higher doses than the high doses we use in a normal, uh, healthy population. So um, that's something we're, we're learning more about now. And uh, I'm working on a big analysis right now to see how the dose affects the, uh, the outcome. So we'll, we'll know more in the next few years. Uh, I've said that with our LSD study, um, with, again, people with uh, life-threatening illnesses, our high dose was 200 micrograms, which we concluded was too low. And so that in future studies, which we don't have funding for, but in future studies, we would use higher doses than that. I think that gets closer to what, what you're saying with psilocybin. Do you want to say anything about dosage with LSD, Amanda? Or do you have any about that? Well, in uh, um, the Beckley Imperial studies with Dave Nutt and Robin K. Hart Harris, we're using quite low doses. I think a little bit too low, 70 micrograms. 70? Yeah. Um, for the first run, but now we will increase it when we do the next one with 60. But I'm hoping to work with Michael Bogentilz on uh, overcoming um, alcohol addiction. And we were talking about having a high dose in, in that, which would be very interesting. Okay, we have another question over here. Uh, how are you doing? Um, well, I have seen the clinical trials with uh, does this sound any better? Oh, yeah. That one's good. Sorry. I've seen it on uh, various clinical trials with such and there are very little adverse side effects. But as more and more clinical trials come out, I believe there may be an issue with individuals that are predisposed to uh, some mental illnesses that may be brought about 
with uh, psychedelic use such as schizophrenia. And uh, although a member of the family may act as a as a signification of whether or not they have they have a predisposition to a mental illness, I was wondering if there's some sort of like biomarker to determine whether or not an individual will be predisposed to having a you know a schizophrenia outbreak or a psychosis due to psychedelics. Uh, nobody else wants this, I may take it a little bit. Um, you know, the, sh the short answer is no. Did you mean if you also want to weigh in on this? Um, the short answer is no. 1% um, uh, of the world population gets schizophrenia. It's sort of cross cultural. Um, there's not much of a way to know ahead of time. There is something called a prodromal illness where people start to sort of get involuted and, and uh, just sort of turn in themselves, spend less time interacting with other people. Maybe they're hiding in the room, maybe they're not bathing as much. They start to have some weird thoughts. Before they get sort of floridly or grossly psychotic, there may be this prodromal period. A lot of people don't recognize that that's what's happening. Um, you know, if you've got a family history of psychosis, if you have relatives who have had manic episodes, if you've got relatives who are schizophrenic, um, you may be more at risk for having sort of a psychotic response to cannabis, to high, to synthetic cannabinoids especially, um, and to some psychedelics. Sometimes people who are bipolar, people who are schizophrenia, uh, a psychedelic experience can be destabilizing. The truth is any of us nods our head. It's a little bit destabilizing for anybody. But um, <laughs> there are certain brain chemistries where they get sort of knocked off track easily and it's hard to get back on track. You know, it's like when your computer goes like buffering, dithering, it takes a while to kind of get back on track. So somebody with bipolar schizophrenia, it's going to take them even longer. Um, it's hard to know ahead of time who's going to have an adverse <coughs> response. But one of the things we should make clear in this kind of research is you're really screening out a lot of people who've got a history of psychosis, who've got first degree relatives with psychotic illness. So you don't tend to run into a lot of big psychotic problems. Uh, anybody else want to talk about this before we go to the next question? Yeah, I think um, what Julie said is exactly right, um, that we don't really know the answer to that question as of right now. However, um, we've been carefully screening people so that uh, people with a, a history of that kind of uh, disorder or family history don't get exposed specifically so we can lower the, the prevalence of those kinds of uh, extended adverse events. But we still do actually see uh, between a quarter and a third of people who get a high dose of psilocybin in the lab have what you might consider an adverse uh, challenging experience, uh, however that's time limited to the course of drug action. So this isn't something like a psychotic outbreak that can um, last for a long time. So. Yeah, I just want to say that um, our treatment model is such that we um, treat people from at, starting at 10 in the morning, it goes till 6 at night, then they spend the night in the treatment center, and then they have um, integrative psychotherapy the next day for several hours. And then once they go home, because it's very difficult sometimes for people to, to integrate what happened, we call people on the phone every day for a week. And we have daily contact with them for uh, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, sometimes longer. So we're very aware that people can have difficulty integrating what happened and processing it. And so we provide that sort of constant care over that first week before they start coming back for the weekly non-drug psychotherapy, which goes then for another um, three to five weeks, and then we set the next MDMA experience. And that's after they've integrated the first. And so there are cases where people have uh, felt like they have needed to drink light or to sleep at night, or they uh, wanted extra psychotherapy and they could come in for that. So I think it's uh, managing that process for the, at least a week after the session to try to mitigate against people going off track. And, and within that kind of heavy touch process, we haven't had any long-term significant adverse events from the therapy. I actually want to just add one little bit of information because this connects to uh, inclusionary and exclusionary criteria for studying, right? Um, and one exclusionary criteria that's present is also a borderline personality disorder. So this is another kind of um, factor that uh, is currently excluded, but uh, I'm personally curious about maybe future studies that might include uh, personality disorder di diagnos diagnoses. Um, well, some of the challenging aspects of it is that it's sort of by definition something that is more um, more rigid, more persistent, something that's almost like a trait of the person. Um, and uh, it would be really interesting to see how uh, psychedelics 
uh, whether they work. Uh, anecdotally, there is, uh, uh, in one of the MDMA PTSD trials, there was an individual who seemed to show some um, narciss strong narcissistic traits. And again, anecdotally, um, the, he, this individual didn't have such a strong response. Uh, and I'm very curious with what I had spoken about, about reflective capacity, right. so the ability to sort of understand one's uh, thought processes and another person's relationally, whether that might be something that might be interfering. Or maybe increased um, capacity. You know, uh, Jose Carlos Busso, who did some research of PTSD and women victim of sexual assaults, which uh, tend to have higher rates of borderline personality disorder diagnoses, uh, he had some stories to tell about some, you know, very intense responses uh, to the patients, the research subjects he was working with, uh, like uh, very disinhibited behavioral responses that were hard to contain. So, um, you know, I think a lot of our thinking is, you know, we start with PTSD, which is very good to quantify, and um, obviously the veterans really need our help, and a lot of people are, I mean, we're all traumatized, face it. Like, if you're not... If you're not traumatized, you're not paying attention. <laughs> so, um, you know, it feels like the right way to start, but eventually, yes, we want to do work with schizophrenia. Yes, we want to do work with antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. And there's so many people. You know, uh, my job as a physician is to alleviate pain and suffering, and there's no question that psychedelics and MDMA and cannabis um, can help do this. So, you know, I'm hoping all in, all in due time. Hi, um, I know that drug development and clinical trials are very expensive. The big pharma is very conservative. So what are the financial models that you see for psychedelic drug development besides what NAPS has done? Or if everyone would just pull what other to support, support developing the drugs, getting them to market. What other financial. developmental models getting the drugs to market besides the one that big pharma uses? No, I mean, big pharma won't touch this. I don't think it right. is right now. So how do you fund well, how, how much money does everyone have in their wallets right now? <laughs> That's our model, too. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll say that, first off, the, the classic psychedelics and MDMA, they're all off patent. And then we hired a patent attorney based on observing what happened with Ibogaine, where they tried a for-profit model, and then everybody started suing each other about trying to, you know, hold on to the various things that they thought might make them money. So I hired a patent, the same patent attorney that helped uh, patent, uh, use patent for Ibogaine, and I hired him to develop an anti-patent strategy. <laughs> so that nobody could ever get a use patent for MDMA. So I think based on that, <laughs> I, I don't, first off also, pharmaceutical companies don't know anything about psychotherapy. So I, I don't think that we're going to see Big Pharma doing anything, but the classic approach has been government grants, and that's something that we haven't been able to get. Until recently, we got a $2.1 million grant from the state of Colorado for the marijuana PTSD study. Um, what we're seeing, I think, is, uh, you know, out in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of young people who, you know, made billions in uh, technology. And stuff, and so we're seeing more and more sort of philanthropist-driven drug development. And there, there is a financial model that's uh, created under Reagan, actually, in 1984. And it's for drugs that are off patent. And what it, what it means is it's data exclusivity. So while you can't have patent protection, nobody can use your data for five years to argue to sell a generic. And in Europe, it's ten years. So I'm hoping that by sort of promoting this knowledge, that maybe some other people would sort of come into it and see that there's a, this window would be the first mover, the first leader. But, but I actually don't think that that's going to happen. And I think it will be through donations that will end up making psychedelics. And then the stigma goes down, and then we'll see government funding. But I, I don't really see the pharmaceutical industry getting involved at all. Is, is there any research on recreational use and whether it's therapeutic? I mean, obviously, everyone's got their own opinion. I mean, recreation in and of itself is therapeutic, right? It's good for your body. It's good for your body.
or <laughs> refugee, but starting looking at recreational use is not meant acceptable. Well, I'll also add, though, that we, we have a study at UCLA now, and it's for autistic adults with social anxiety. And we're getting really excellent results. And in fact, today is one of the people who's getting MDMA in that study. With uh, Alicia Danforth. Yeah, Alicia Danforth. Well, they're, they're getting an experimental session, actually, so I don't 100% know. So it's, it's Alicia Danforth and Charlie Grove. But the reason that that study is happening in the first place is because of what we're calling crowdsourced drug development. So a bunch of young people have gone to raves and taken what they think is ecstasy, what they think is MDMA, and some of them get real MDMA, and some people have reported that they were uh, Asperger's or on the autistic spectrum, and that now afterwards they have a lasting ability to understand body language, to understand emotions, to feel more comfortable speaking out to, in romantic situations, and, and that started developing this sort of um, information on the internet and then more and more people started reporting that. And so then there was over 50 people that there were stories on the internet about recreational use having these lasting therapeutic benefits. And so Alicia did her PhD dissertation contacting those people and contacting their families, their doctors, and then that was the core data that we used to submit to FDA to do the first clinical study. So there is evidence that recreational use in certain circumstances can be therapeutic. Um, I too have a list of emails from people with schizophrenia and we've had good results with MDMA that I keep if anybody wants to contact them and do any kind of follow-up. Um, so I, I like this idea of crowdsourcing. Did you want to say something about it? Yeah, go. Yeah, and we do actually, so we got really interested after seeing such uh, positive results in our smokers, for instance. And we heard from, we did an online survey, we heard from over 1,100 people in 52 different countries that said that after uh, uh, using a serotonergic hallucinogen like LSD or psilocybin, that they either quit or greatly reduce their smoking. Some people for over 20 years after that experience. Uh, we, uh, right now, shameless plug, we have a study uh, online uh, that's a survey for people who had similar experience with the psychedelic and then quit drinking alcohol or quit using other drugs of abuse like heroin. And so we hope to. Um, publish those findings soon. So, yeah, we're trying to understand what's happening outside the lab as well because um, certainly 52 different countries, 1,100 people, that's just for tobacco. Um, that, that points to some, something else recreational as well. So, We, we use crowdfunding in our LSD study. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, we weren't going for very much money, but we got double the amount within 48 hours, I think it was. So it showed a kind of big... Yeah, I forget how many countries, 48 countries or something. So it's an interesting way. This reminded me, this is actually to the point of the previous questions about funding. Did, didn't Becky also work with, or it was Robin who was doing it with the television uh, network who helped fund it? Am I understanding? Yeah. Am I understanding this case? Yeah. Um, which one was that? Channel 4. Channel 4. Oh, Channel 4. We did channel, two Channel 4s. One was. Um, <laughs> One with MDMA, the early one. Actually, I think it's rather a disaster we're doing it with Channel 4. It, it's like the changes, you know, it makes the research more urgent to get results. And it, I, I, I'm slightly against Channel 4, though we do have two viewers or something. But, um, so we did with, once with MDMA, and then again with, um, earlier this year, with Canvas. But um, the, the poor person in the machine, <coughs> John Snow was given much too much, but obviously oh, much too much, much and had a free <laughs> So I want to say a couple quick things. One is this, this issue of recreational model versus medical model. I mean, obviously, I'm the issue of the choir. You guys understand that because of our nation's drug policy, the recreational model is currently more dangerous. We don't know what we're getting. You don't. There's no quality control, etc. Uh, you know, we've got all kinds of issues with overheating, overhydrating. Please, women, especially when you're premenstrual, you retain water. MDMA helps you retain water, okay? You do not want to drink too much water if you are a woman and you're taking MDMA. And um, I obviously this goes for men too, but you know, women, we have special times where we retain more water. The overhydration is a real danger. Um, in terms of TV and helping us, hurting us, I just I feel like I have to say one quick thing, which is uh, uh, I didn't know anything about CBD when I started researching the pop book. I was like an idiot. I didn't even know the difference between sativa and indica when I started researching the pop book, which I was like cringing, but it's true. I just I didn't know anything, so I learned. 
And then I wanted to educate others. And one of the people that I educated was working with Sanjay Gupta. And I got to spend a long time with Sanjay teaching him about CBD. He didn't know anything. And that was an instance where a little bit of media exposure had a tremendous positive effect on our nation's drug policy. And now, you know, the state-by-state -state patchwork is a disaster. We all know that. And the New York law is the worst. Don't get me started. But um, some laws are CBD only. It's bad and it's good, but at least we're, you know, people are, it's like everyone sort of already accepted that CBD is, you know, uh, therapeutic and beneficial for certain patient populations. So, I mean, this was, this was an instance where I thought media exposure was very helpful. Um, and I think, you know, Rick has had plenty of good experiences with the media, but that could be a whole other, maybe that should be another conference agenda issue sometime. Um, this was great for me. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everybody's questions, but my assumption is most of these people would love to keep talking. Not me, I'm out of here. Um, but thanks everybody for coming and this has been a great conference. This is a great